<coughs> so some of you might know that this product was used a lot in Europe back 30 years ago. Um, so in Europe, it was used as a growth promoter. Here in Canada and in the US, it's approved as a treatment. It's to be used at 80 ppm. When, when you look at avilamycin, for us, what we are proud of is in that class of antimicrobial, which is called orthosomycin. Avilamycin is the first antimicrobial developed. Orthosomycin are not used in human medicine. And then it's the, f yes, Isabel. I don't know that question, so. What is the question? Thank you. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> that's true, they don't all understand what you and I, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> the question is, since it is not used in human medicine, will it end up with a class four from CFIA? It, it, they did not tell us. And so we don't want to speculate that it will necessarily be four. It could be three. It could end up being not classified for many years. There's only one molecule. So the question is, are there many molecules like that? You mean that, that are not classified? No. There are not that many that are approved now. And other products that have been approved recently were part of existing family. So this is a first in that situation. There's, there's another first about a Cermax. It's the first one that will be prescription across all Canada. We are pioneering uh, the fact that, uh, that with the new regulation, prescription will become compulsory across all the country now. And this is the first product to be in that situation. The mode of action, <coughs> I will tell you very quickly, it affects protein synthesis. And I, I will uh, skip to the next slide and before someone asks a question. <laughs> <laughs> I was planning to ask, we do have a, a microbiologist who actually lives in the UK, and I was planning to talk with him this week and we did not connect. So I, I was hoping to have more information about the mode of action, but uh, I could not. So. It's one of those that touch the ribosome uh, S50 something. So now I'll present you the study that we submitted to VDD for registration. So it's a very straightforward study intended to look at the efficacy of avilamycin and how we, we went about studying uh, the effect of that product. We took 800 pigs, we split them in four different nursery sites Half of the pen were on Cermax, the other half of the pen were on plain diet. The, the medication was placed right at weaning, so we have a claim that says feed before the, the, the appearance of clinical sign. We have that claim because that's what we submitted. The medication was placed in the big, at, right at the beginning. The observation period is four weeks, so that means the last week of the study was plain diet for all the pigs. Now there's a particularity about that study. The government insisted that we do a field experimentation rather than a challenge experimentation. And we were concerned that if we place clean pigs into clean barns, we would end up with no E. coli challenge. So to avoid that situation, we went into Wisconsin and we purchased pigs that we knew were having historically a lot of E. coli problem. We raised those pigs for one week into those barns. We pulled out the pigs. We washed the barn, but we did not disinfect. And we kept the thermometer, the, ter the thermostat a bit low, just to make sure they would end up with E. coli. Uh, in terms of characterization, I was able to find out that it, the pili is an F18, but I don't know about its toxin profile. In terms of gross results, so here are the 40 pens on each treatment. Here are the split of 400 pigs on each side. The mortality in non-treated pigs is 3%. The mortality in Cermax pigs is 4.3%. Before we started the study, we decided for humane reason 
If a pig has a very liquid diarrhea and look, it's gaunt, it's, his stomach is sucked in, then we will pull those pigs. We won't let finish the trial. So in non-treated pigs, we have 18.8% of those pigs that were pulled. And in treated pigs, we end up 14.7% of those pigs were pulled. A little bit about the diet. It's all pelleted diet. And because it, it was looking at the, the treatment of Surmax, the zinc level is nutritional level here. And the copper level, for those of you who are into this, it's a high level, <coughs> higher than in Canada, and it's because it's the US uh, uh, baseline. The study was really looking at clinical sign comparison. So we did monitor diarrhea score, depression score, and gauntness. And how we went about measuring diarrhea, every day we picked up the pigs. If we <coughs> see the pigs having a diarrhea at that moment, we would score it. But if the pig was not having diarrhea, we actually placed a rectal, rectal swab and we observed the diarrhea. So that's how the diarrhea was scored. I say that. And I did mention to you that we placed the pigs in a, an environment that we knew for sure had E. coli. It's because I want to prepare the background for the prevalence in non-treated pig, which is 90%. So in the, if, I think if we know this background, we can understand why there are so many pigs in that field trial that have diarrhea. When they are on Surmax, a significantly lower proportion of pigs were having showing diarrhea. And if we look at the same information, but graphically presented differently, this is what it looked like. Here you have the observation period from day 0 to 21. And here you have your split, 2 times 400 pigs. So 90% incidence is the cumulative figure. And what I take from this figure is that all along, from 0 to pretty much 18 days, pigs and the non-treated pigs keep infecting each other, and more and more pigs are expressing diarrhea. In the Surmax pigs, after one week, pretty much there's no more infection of new pigs happening. Now this is the, the severity of the diarrhea. So in non-treated pigs, they were liquid or semi-solid, where in the Surmax group, they were semi-solid to normal. Same situation, if we look at it with more detail, we see that as the pigs arrive, there's no diarrhea. So at some point in here, they get infected. And after about seven days on Surmax, the severity of the diarrhea start declining. In terms of alertness, the, the pigs on, that were not treated versus the pigs that were treated were significantly different. And in terms of gut fill, there was a numerical difference. In terms of gut fill, there was a numerical difference between the, the two groups. I will present the growth information just for completeness. But keep in mind that the primary objective of the study was to compare clinical sign. Non-treated pigs left after 21 days at 8.1 kilo. And treated pigs were 800 grams heavier. This same information in daily weight gain amounts to 130 gram versus 170 gram. There was no difference in average daily feed intake. And myself, what I thought I could do with the average daily feed intake is look a little bit into the dose. And so this is my weight of uh, live weight, and this is their average intake. So if you take the 80 ppm, it amounts to about 2.2 milligrams per kg. If you look at the normal intake for that age of pigs, it would be more around 350 grams per day. So the dose would be more around 3 milligrams per kg. And I take the time to, to look at this because I'm thinking, this is our study. The effect was significant the Surmax was reducing clinical sign, and actually they were having a low intake to start with. Feed efficiency, there was no difference. And so all in all, when we submitted this information, 
We obtained a claim where avilamycin reduced the diarrhea incidence and severity associated with E. coli. <coughs> and for your information, as we pulled the medication for the period 21 to 28 days, there was no resurgence of problem. So now, there was something that was intriguing for, for people who kept looking at uh, Cermax, which is it, 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 there's evidence in swine that it does have an effect on E. coli. However, when you look at standard MIC value, it kind of raises a question. So here, these are swine bacteria for which I could find an MIC value. This is the number of isolate we tested. And here are the MIC value. So you can see clearly, with low MIC value, avilamycin is made for gram-positive bacteria. And when you look at gram-negative uh, bacteria, such as E. coli, the MIC value is high. Therefore, E. coli is naturally resistant to Surmax. But as I said, trials we had done in the field were showing that it does have an effect on E. coli. So what we did, we wanted to look at what happened to the pili and what happened to the ability of E. coli to attach when it's exposed to avilamycin. So we on purpose went to a library of E. coli and we selected E. coli that had really high MIC value and then we took a few that were F5, F4, F18 and some non-specific E. coli and then we exposed them to different dose of Surmax and different uh, exp um, exposure time. So this is what the result looked like. This is a normal E. coli seen under electronic microscopy. So you see the rod-shaped bacteria and the different pili. And now going from here to here to here, you have higher and higher and higher dose of avilamycin. And you see that the number of pili and the shape of it is being uh, uh, affected. So first observation, the effect Surmax has on E. coli is dose dependent. If you look at a, a normal E. coli exposed for 24 hours, this is what it looked like. Then you take an e. coli, the same strain and you expose it for 8 hours and 24 hours. You have another observation. Avilamycin effect is also time dependent. The end result of that, this is a, a cross section of an intestine and then you see a few bacteria that were able to attach. And this is a, the same image in a plain Petri dish. So there's evidence that what we see on the pili is actually affecting the ability of the bacteria to attach to the brush, to the border of the intestine. So our hypothesis is that this protein synthesis, uh, the, motor, the, the, the normal natural mode of action of the, the antimicrobial, which is to affect the protein synthesis, is having an effect on the pili formation. And because of, of less effective pili, there's less adhesion, and subsequently there's less toxin release, and thereby it, that's how it's reducing the severity of the E. coli. So avilamycin is bacteriostatic. It inhibits pilis formation, and it most likely also inhibits attachment to the brush border vesicle or to the, the intestine. How it is intended to be used, at the Surmax 200, it's to be used at 0.4 kilos per ton, which results in 80 ppm. It's to be used for 21 days. We talk about judicious use of antimicrobial, so more and more when we have new claim, they put time limits and duration limit. And so now there is this claim that says, do not feed to pigs older than 14 weeks of age. It's important to keep in mind when we do have mixing error at the mill, it does have an impact on sequencing. And then it is, in those circumstances, it is without any withdrawal.